tonight on Insights on PBS Hawaii. Is a Waikiki casino, bets on horse racing, or shipboard gambling the winning solution to boost state revenues, or just the cause for more social ills? Now, live in our studio, our host, Dan Boylan. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Dan Boylan. The legislature is in season in tough fis fiscal times, and that means, as it has for the last decade or more, that the siren song of legalized gambling beckons Hawaii's lawmakers. Hawaii and Utah are the only two states in the union in which the gaming industry has not set up shop. But new state worker contracts and unfunded liabilities for public worker pensions and health care require new sources of state revenue. Can legalized gambling help meet the need? During this legislative session, lawmakers are now considering more than 30 bills that relate to various forms of gaming. They include proposed casinos for Waikiki and Kapole, bingo, raffles, shipboard gambling, horse betting, and a state lottery. Legislation also calls for establishing a Hawaii Gaming Control Commission. Tonight on Insights, we welcome panelists who view legalized gambling as the winning ticket to help create financial stability for our islands. We also welcome those who think gambling will only bring crime, corruption, and more social ills. Please join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments for our guests. The contact information you now see on your screen will be repeated throughout the program. We also want to remind you that Insights is live on both your television and computer screens. It's streaming on our website right now at pbshawaii.org. This program will also be posted online. Now to our panel. Ben Cayetano is the former governor of Hawaii. He was elected to two terms as the state's chief executive, serving from 1994 to 2002. Before that, he was twice elected lieutenant governor and previously served a dozen years in the state legislature. Just last year, Ben ran for Honolulu mayor. Alex Santiago is a social worker and founder owner of Health and Human Services Advocates. During the 1990s, Alex was a state lawmaker representing the North Shore District of Oahu for 10 years and chaired the House Health Committee. John Radcliffe is a lobbyist with Radcliffe & Associates, one of Hawaii's leading governmental and legislative consulting firms. He has represented some of the nation's largest corporations, trade associations, unions, and government officials before the legislature and the executive branches of our government. John Kent is Professor Emeritus of Business and Legal Policy in the Department of Business Administration at the University of Illinois. His research is focused on the societal, business, and economic impacts of decriminalizing gambling activities. Uh, Governor Cayetano, uh, we're honored to have you. And uh, it seems to me, I remember a long time ago when you were still governor, uh, arguing that, that maybe we, we should go to legalized gambling. Why? Well, at that time, uh, uh, Dan, uh, I, I proposed putting the question to the people in the form of a constitutional amendment. And uh, actually, my, my views on gambling, uh, I've always been against casino gambling, Las Vegas style. But since then, I've, it's evolved a little bit because there are places I found out through my research, whether it be in, in Queensland, in Australia, or other places where uh, they've given exclusive licenses for gambling uh, to, uh, to establish casinos. And for example, uh, uh, that uh, I think uh, avoids the problems that we see, we, we see caused by the kind of gambling you have in uh, Las Vegas where you can find a, a one-armed bandit in a, in a grocery store. And so I, and, I, and I've talked to people, uh, spoke to Steve Wynn, for example, and others, uh, and I think that uh, the question, we don't have referendum, but you can do it through a constitutional amendment. Uh, uh, the question should be put to the people. Uh, the polls, as I recall, John, you may correct me, indicate that about 70% of the people are for it, right? Well, about Closer to 60. 60 percent. About 60 percent. Uh, Asian tourists a lot higher. Have we polled uh, Asian tourists? Yes. Uh, uh, how? Uh, how? Well, are... there was a there's a, a 10 year study that was done, a longitudinal study that was done by a professor at uh, HPU, uh, who's big in the travel industry business, 
Uh, he did a 10-year study on it with the Japanese and found that uh, the Japanese, about 80% of them, would like to have some form of gambling, something to do when they come here other than what they now have to do. Chinese and Koreans were polled a couple of years ago, and they're or higher than that. They're over 80%. Well, excuse me. The poll I was talking about was a poll of the local residents. Yeah. Local, right. yeah, local residents. Uh, the latest poll we did, the Waikiki Improvement Association did a poll a year ago, and about 56% or 60% of the people who had said that they would like, like a, a one casino with an entertainment center in Waikiki. And the big issue there was entertainment for them. They wanted some, some place like that to go. Uh, and, a, and quite a number of them said that um, they would not go to Nevada or they would, fewer, they would go to Nevada fewer times than they now go. As you know now, I think you should know, about five, we take about 500,000 trips a year to Las Vegas. We have a population of a million three, which means that people go more than once. A lot of people go more than once in a year at about $1,000 a pop. So that's $500 million that leaves our state after taxes and goes to benefit the great people of Nevada. A lot of those people would stay home if there was an entertainment center, a complex that had a casino uh, as the, of the kind that the governor mentioned in, in Waikiki or in, 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 in Hawaii. Then why shouldn't we do it? I think the case has been made. We can adjourn this and go home, right? Uh, John, why, can't, why shouldn't we do it? Well, let, let me talk about Illinois, the president's other home state. Uh, we were one of the first states to get the lottery, one of the first states to get the casinos after New Jersey. Uh, there in the Midwest. Uh, that occurred about 1990. My colleagues and I set, looked at the, the data that was provided by the gambling industry, and we were asked by the governor's office to do this. They wanted to build a $2 billion casino complex in downtown Chicago. It's still not there, and for economic reasons. And we looked at the data, and we said, you know, this looks really good when we first looked at it. And after about 20 minutes, I looked at my colleagues around the table, and everybody was saying, these numbers are incorrect, and in some cases just plain bogus. And what happened was, the legislation went through, we had 10 casino licenses. On the, the fair market value of a casino license today, on the open market, is half a billion dollars. These first 10 casino licenses were given away in good old Illinois for $25,000 a piece, including to one person who's now in jail as part of the Governor Rod Blagojevich scandals. So that was a $5 billion giveaway of the Illinois Treasury. And today, 20 years later, Illinois, has, which has relied on gambling, has the worst state budget in the country, the worst credit rating of any of the 50 states, and the gambling industry arguably owes the state $10 billion to $47 billion. Now, I'm on the University of Illinois Faculty and Staff uh, Pensions and uh, Benefits Committee. I'm actually the chair. And one major reason, as my colleagues and I say, that we don't have any money in this state is because the gambling interests haven't paid up. And the governor of Illinois now has a new bill for more gambling in Illinois that's another $10 billion giveaway but, but, but John, sitting on his desk. You, you, you're not claiming that all of the, the problems with their, the debt and corruption in the state of Illinois all comes back to gambling, are you? I'm saying it's a major contributing factor, and my colleagues and I have been saying this for well over 20 years. We said that the social uh, problems would, would tap into uh, the state budget uh, the taxes haven't been paid. Uh, last year, the state of Illinois raised the state income tax on people 67 percent. At the same time, they reduced the taxes on the gambling interests. And now the governor has about 30 days to sign or veto a bill that's sitting on his desk that's another $10 billion giveaway to the gambling interests. So the gambling interests are basically dictating economic policy in the state of Illinois and the, the teachers' unions, everybody, all the public employees are desperate about the state budget. And one major, major reason is because of this gambling domination in our state legislature. John? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, that's kind of hogwash. The, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the governor of the state of Illinois did the state of the state speech today uh, and indicated today 
of the terrible condition of the, of the Illinois Treasury. They are, now, they are now putting out bond money to pay for uh, their, their uh, operating expenses, which is a little bit like borrowing money to pay for your credit card. Illinois has not paid any of its unfunded liability for public employees for decades. They're the absolute worst in the nation. It's got nothing to do with, with casinos. It's got everything to do with horrible policy. And, 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 and the horrible policy is listening to the gambling interests who've been raiding the public treasury. We actually had a bill you passed in, excuse me, we had a bill passed in 2005 that in the Illinois House passed 67 to 42. And it was designed, it's, it was simply two lines. The first line was, the casinos are gone. My colleagues and I went, we testified in Springfield, which is our capital. The legislature listened. They passed this with almost a two-thirds vote majority saying, we're getting rid of the casinos. They're not working here in Illinois. Well, our governor was Rod Blagojevich at the time. Guess what happened to that bill? It didn't, it didn't, was never signed into law. So the point is that the gambling interests are now dominating economic policy in the state of Illinois and in several other states. And Illinois is at the top of the bankruptcy list. Nevada's up there. California's up there. Alex, uh, you were in the legislature for 10 years and you opposed uh, gambling. Uh, you know, let, let me just clarify. I mean, I was my entire 10 year tenure, Governor, you were there that eight years. And um, we worked well on some issues and we clashed on others. I definitely went in with an open mind. Um, my community, basically Turtle Bay, <laughs> was yeah. built with the intent, I think, of ultimately, it was, everyone says its design was for a casino. I went in with an open mind, and it was probably around 92, 93, when we, we had the National Conference of State Legislators up in um, New Orleans. And I remember going up there and hearing the story of how their state was led to believe that if you, if you go ahead and approve lottery, as an example, and you control it, you're gonna, it's going to solve all the problems. We're going to send the money to schools, et cetera. And they did. And I was speaking to a legislator from New Orleans who was a longtime legislator, and he said, you know what, we bought it. And the economy spiked. They said a few years later, the people stopped buying the, the tickets. You know, people got tired of it. And they said, you know, I'm not going to win. So the economy fell off. But however, the government already got used to, to spending those income, the revenues that was coming in. So the Gaming Institute went back to them and said, okay, so what you need to do is diversify. You need to go ahead and put it on a shipboard, control it off, you know, not on land. So they did that. Again, they saw a spike. And the legislator said what was predicted by people, a few years later, they decided that came down. So they said we need casinos on land, and so they came on land. What happened as a result of that was those of us who had watched or saw that said, is that the same route that we want to go? And for me, as a social worker who spent most of my career, including my time in the legislature, looking at how these kinds of things will affect the people who have the least, the facts all show that those with the least are impacted the worst by whenever you, inst whenever you implement gaming into a, into a community like this. So the concerns we have is the long-term effects of Governor, what Governor, you want to impact the worst? Well, uh, let me uh, comment on uh, the professor's uh, uh, story about Illinois. You know, it seems to me that if you don't collect the taxes from the gambling interests, that's a problem of administration and the government. I mean, Illinois has had how many governors went to jail already? Uh, George Ryan. Uh, Five out of the last seven. Right. You know, so Illinois got a problem. We, you know, I, I don't think we have that problem over here and maybe in the other 47 states that have gambling. Now, maybe the, the, the uh, professor, maybe you can, the, the question for you is, had they collected that revenue that the gambling interests owed, how would it have affected the, the financial health of the state of Illinois. They're, they're never going to collect that revenue. And no. the reason they're not going to collect that revenue is because the gambling interests dominate the state. Our U.S. No, no, the question excuse is. Me, excuse me, Governor. The, the, the Let me question finish. Is this. Let me finish. You can finish, but the question is this. Had the, that revenue been collected, would it have, you know, uh, uh, helped or uh, hurt the economy of the state? Well, I would say that it would have hurt the economy of the state as gambling saturates a state if we're just talking about gambling. The studies show, and our, as I started to mention earlier, 
Our U.S. Senator back in 1992, Paul Simon, was so concerned about this that he established and sponsored the United States National Gambling Impact Study Commission. And it came back with a recommendation that there should be a moratorium on the expansion of any type of gambling anywhere in the United States, that slot machines convenient to the public should be recriminalized, that there should be absolutely no gambling on the Internet. We have followed that up with multiple volumes of the United States International Gambling Report. This is just one of several volumes. We call it the Red Flag Report on Gambling to warn about what gambling, in fact, does. And gambling is simply a transfer of money. You're not creating any product. And modern gambling today is about slot machines. Slot machines are known by the National Commission, not my terminology, but the National Commission, the bipartisan Congressional Commission, as the crack cocaine of creating new addicted gamblers. So they hook people and create all these social what, problems. What about horse racing? Well. I'm going to concentrate on slot machines and horse racing today, and the industry will tell you, is a dying industry. Right. And so you see, you see the, the proposals reason I brought up horse racing, to bring Dan, in slot machines to save the horse racing industry. The reason I brought up horse racing is J. Edgar, Edgar Hoover had a seat at the horse racing uh, facility. He was an ardent better. You know, I, I think that's public information. Uh, you know. Um, uh, the problem, Alex, that, that, that I have with your approach is that my recollection is you guys always come back and ask for money for your programs. And the issue that's before us, and one reason why I've come aboard with respect to, to gambling, is because, and I'm talking about limited gambling, you know, I'm not talking about uh, slot machines in, 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 you know, in grocery stores, uh, is because we don't have the money to pay for the programs like that you support. And the problem is, is that this is not, uh, today, the, the legislature is not like it was in the past uh, then. In the past, the poor had a lobby, a very strong lobby. People like Lena Rivera, remember her? She would come down and she would really affect. Aquan McElrath. Aquan oh, McElrath. Those people are all gone. Today, the poor have to rely Jones. on the collective conscience of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the, the politicians. And it's the other guys who have the power, the unions and, and everybody else. But, but, but I want to go back to a question I started to yeah. ask you. Why, why, it is no, uh, uh, gambling is known as a regressive tax. I mean, it's, it, it, it's going to get uh, the little guy worse than anybody else, the guy who's putting a quarter in the slot machine and so, and so forth. Uh, do we really want a, another regressive tax? I mean, our state excise tax is a, re a regressive tax uh, that, that hits the, the smallest guy the worst. Do we need more regressive tax? Shouldn't it be progressive in some way, shape, well, or form? If, if we're spending uh, $500 million a year of our money in Nevada every year, why not spend some of that money here? If we've got a tourist population that says, me, 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 I'd like to have it, please, and we say, no, uh, why not spend it that way? Why not do that? And what, what the governor has just tried to indicate, I think, is that we are now faced, you're faced with, and we're all faced with a situation where we have to do one of several things. We have to reduce benefits to public employees and retirees. Or we have to raise taxes somehow, that regressive excise tax or all the other taxes or whatever, we've got to do that. Or we've got to find new sources of revenue or some combination of all three of those things. Mm -hmm. But I want to point out that we now have a situation where not as bad as Illinois. But we're but, bad. But we're in bad, bad shape. And within our lifetimes yet on this table, we are going to be bankrupt in this state if we don't do something. I, I don't know. I, I, I just know it. that three of the five here look pretty bad. We're not going to be around long. But John here referred to the, the governor of Illinois and his uh, uh, latest uh, pronouncements in the press. But he has repeatedly said you can't gamble your way to prosperity. And the way for people to look at this is to simply think about a single slot machine. A single slot machine takes in $300,000 out of the consumer economy every year. Now that is money that's not being spent on cars, refrigerators, computers, and even around these gambling facilities, people are spending 10% less on food, 25% less on clothing, 37% are rating their bank accounts in order to gamble. You talk about poor people getting poorer. So 
when this money is going into these slot machines, and slot machines don't create jobs, you just dust them off and collect the money. So when money's going into these slot machines, which is 90% of gambling today, including at, at the tracks, they're all going to slot machines, that's taking money out of the consumer economy. So you're losing sales tax revenues, you're losing all the traditional tax revenues that are associated with the consumer economy. And a, and a last example, uh, they had slot machines widespread in South Carolina. Governor David Beasley wiped the slate clean, threw them all out of the state. A lot of their social problems went away, their tax rate went down, their revenues went up, uh, the crime rate went down. And so uh, the way to go is to simply get rid of the gambling, which is what Illinois tried to do and didn't have the political muscle to do it. Well, Alex, I, I, does North Carolina South Carolina still, did. Do they still have a gambling? Uh, they have a lottery. A lottery, anything else? They, have? they don't have, the, it's, it's about slot machines, Governor, with due respect. I know, I, well, we do respect to you, Professor. Slot machines is what we're talking about. We're talk I understand what the point that you made about slot machines and the, the kind of gambling that I, that, that I support it's not slot machines. I'm talking about a casino. Well, gambling still has these type... Uh, casinos today are 90% of their revenues coming out of slot machines. They don't even care about James Bond and the, and the little card games. It's all about slot machines. And once they're in here, you can't stop them because they're not creating anything. There's no product, so they will continue to expand. And, in, and with respect, Governor, in Illinois, the latest proposal for construction funds was to bring in 45,000 to 75,000 more slot machines, with most of the money going to the uh, owners of the slot machines. John, do you mean that when I was playing that nickel slot machine in Las <laughs> Vegas, that, that, that place was thinking about me? I don't believe you, John. Uh, I want, but I want to ask, sure. why, uh, the, something that, that, that uh, Ben brought up. Um, why don't why don't you guys or why didn't legislature why didn't you just raise some taxes? I mean taxes if you want to deal with the problem raise some taxes mm -hmm. progressively. Uh, yeah, progressively progressively Absolutely. raise some taxes. Yeah. Why do we have why why go uh, with? Know, there's a lot of different things that they can look at. The earned income tax credit is something that's being talked about. Other progressive ways to do it. But I wanted to just respond no, to. No, no, but I, but but I think there's a problem here, isn't it? That isn't it? Frankly, that there's the feeling that you can get an entertainment business like like gambling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you can, and you have political oppositions, stronger political opposition to raising the tax. I, I believe so. Isn't it cowardice? Well, well, by the way, I've been out of office for 12 years. Yes, so but you remember. <laughs> well, but, but, but my record shows, Dan, and Governor would probably attest to it, that I was in favor of a more progressive instead of this after I objectively looked at what I saw. I, but I do want to respond to a couple of things that the governor basically talked about. I agree with him that the advocacy voice for the poor today is much softer than it used to be. And there was a time when I remember uh, we did have strong advocates. We don't anymore. And that's a very sad fact. But the fact that we, we rely on this social conscience that may not be as active today and as a result we have cuts that's occurring for the very most vulnerable people. I say two wrongs don't make a right. And I say that because to think that we're going to control the gaming interest once it gets its foothold in Hawaii, I think is really um, naive. I think that the, every state that has gone down this route has seen a proliferation of gaming to the point where, and we all know the effects that the lobbyists will have what, on the process the that goes on. Uh, what's the basis for that statement? Of the, the proliferation of yeah. gaming? Mm -hmm. It's based on all of the, the literature that I've read. And again, the, 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 the example that I used in New Orleans when they said they were going to control yeah. it through lottery, and they said that's all we were going to do. They got addicted to the revenues that was coming in, so when the revenues fell off, they said we needed to diversify. They went to shipboard. Shipboard did the same thing. It spiked, it came back down. Then they said, okay, we need it on, on, on the ground. And Hemeter was the first one there who built the casinos there. And then it had all the social problems. And again, the two wrongs that don't make a right, Dan, is what I'm saying is as an advocate for those who are the most disadvantaged, this is going to be not just regressive. The social ills that will come as a result is something that I don't think we're going to be able to take back once it's let go. John? You were going to say something? Well, you know, he, he's been out of office for 12 years, and Louisiana is still working. I mean, Louisiana still got gaming, and it's doing fine. You know, <laughs> you know, the home state of Wisconsin, for example, where I was born and raised, you know, you were Iowa, and he's Illinois, Mich uh, Mich Michigan, excuse <laughs> me. Uh, um, 
we have 28 casinos in Wisconsin now. They're doing just fine. They're, they're, they're Native American casinos, but you know, they have more money, they're better off, the people are going to school, everything's okay. There's no crime, there's no violence, there's no, none of this malarkey that you hear about. That, that's, that's not accurate. The, uh, first of well, all, on Louisiana, accurate. several of the parishes in Louisiana have thrown out the slot machines when they had the political power to do so. So you're absolutely correct, Alex, when you said, mentioned that. Uh, with regard to the uh, tribal interests, studies done by the Boston Globe, LA Times, national newspapers on the mainland show that 2% of the Native Americans are getting 50% of the gambling money. 75% of the Native Americans on the mainland get zero. Now, this has come out in congressional hearings in Washington, D.C. Um, it's, it's well known. Uh, I would uh, recommend that people go see a uh, Time Magazine article by Bartland Steele, a cover story that was done a few years ago, and it really documents a lot of the abuses that are going on. Yes, indeed, if you drive there, it, it, it looks great, but I've sat in congressional hearings with a Native American lady next to me where she was crying in front of the committee saying, I'm being shot at, our family's being molested uh, by gambling interests. And, and there is a very difficult problem in enforcing uh, or, or, or curtailing uh, the activities that are going on on these different Native American reservations. So I, I just want to indicate it's not all the roses. Yes, indeed, there are some positives going on, but the studies show that there's a large degree of negative. John, I, I, I just, look, I've had students at the University of Hawaii come up to me and say, oh, Dr. Boylan, I'm not going to be in school next week because uh, for the next week, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to hear that they've got to take care of their grandmother. And he says, I've got to go to uh, Las Vegas. And that's the end of the story. I mean, w going to Las Vegas is as much a part of life in Hawaii, I sometimes think, as Christmas, Easter, and Boys' Day and Girls' Day. And where's I the mean, crime? And uh, where's the crime from that? Well, I'm not saying it's a crime. My point is that that's what people do. We like, we, in the but we like not, gambling. Talking about the we crime like in Hawaii. gambling yeah. uh, in and Hawaii. We're, we're, Dan, we're, yeah. we're talking about you, government. You know, you talk about gambling being a form of a regressive tax, but it's a less regressive because people have a choice. Whereas if you were to raise the general excise tax, everybody pays for it. And the thing about it is that we are pretty. We had. Eight million tourists, I think, this year, right? Yes. Right. And a lot of those tourists, whether they be Chinese, Koreans, or Japanese, gamble. They like to gamble. Uh, yes, but they don't. Excuse me, Governor, but they don't come here to gamble. From the data that I've seen, and the, the other point I'd like to make is that the solution, as you brought up earlier, for Illinois, for Hawaii, for all other states, those that have the gambling, is to grow the economy. It was a great bumper year last year. Uh, 2012, I think, was a record year for the number of visitors. You had more hotel occupancy. Uh, you had uh, uh, visitors spending more. Uh, it was a bumper year. And, and Dan, when I was here in 2009 and things were really, really slow in the tourism industry, we said, stick with the program. Don't go to gambling. And I'm glad to see it's bounced back. And I think in 2013, you can have another banner year. So stick with your strengths. Well, you know, I, I agree with that. But the thing about it is that we are being overrun and inundated by, and there's a great imbalance now of tourism jobs compared to everything else, yep. okay? Mm -hmm. So we need to do something. We've tried high tech, we've tried all the kind of different things that uh, they tried on the mainland, and we don't have the infrastructure, whether it's the university, uh, you know, uh, engineering school, uh, to do high tech and all of that. Uh, we found that lesson, those lessons out the hard way. George Arioshi tried aquaculture. It got to the point where the state was growing the fingerlings and gave it away free because he wanted it to succeed. It failed, you know. We, we, when I was in office, we, 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 we pushed high tech. Found out the hard way that all the other 49 states are, are doing the same thing, giving tax <coughs> breaks and all of that. And the problem that we have here in Hawaii is that our University of Hawaii doesn't have a good engineering school. And nobody's gonna invest in that. You know, I wanted to... I wish I could defend, but I don't, uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> good, good, good in history. Um, that's that. <laughs> you know, one of the things that the meant. professor <laughs> indicated early on was, was the bad state of the economy in Illinois. And according to our 
Director of Budget and Finance, Calbert Young. He says that in order for us not to get in that shape, we've got to, beginning this year, put $500 million a year aside in, from gen general fund money that we would get. We've got to put $500 million in a lockbox in order to prevent us from, from going over that particular fiscal cliff because of our aging retiree population in the public sector. Now, the governor knew he couldn't get $500 million. So he put, it, he put in his state of the state speech and so forth, he wanted $100 million. Yeah. Does anybody at this table think that the legislature is going to put $100 million away right now for the future? I don't think so. I don't think so. The, 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 governor's, <laughs> just, the governor's just mentioned all these proposals that, that have been less than successful. Well, I've just given a great example of how gambling hasn't been successful, and it won't be successful for Hawaii. So I, I would learn from the lessons of history. Well, Are you going to be condemned to relive them? Uh, we may have a different opinion about the lessons of history. You know, uh, you know, I, I didn't come to my position, uh, you know, just by chance. I, I, I talked to people uh, uh, like Steve Wynn, for example, you know, and, uh, and uh, we, we talked about the, the negative side of gambling and the positive side of gambling. Uh, so uh, we get that kind of information. Nevada has all kind of problems because they rely very heavily on gambling. There are many places, many states in the, in the United States where, where, you know, gambling is really virtually invisible, right? That's you right. know, uh, but they have gambling. Well, uh, uh, we've got some folks calling in and I've got to get to some of this. If Illinois is legalized gambling and Illinois budget currently sucks, why would Hawaii want to legalize gambling? Well, you're asking me. I'm saying don't legalize gambling. <laughs> because the Hawaii governors would collect the, the tax that the, the gambling interests are not, not being not, paid. Have That's not right. well, have failed well, to uh, collect. Well, let me just address that quickly, Governor. We have 28 states that we say in the United States International Gambling Report are dominated by gambling lobbyists and are virtually dictating economic policy. And let, let me just, for, for your uh, viewership, if they'll just go to 60 Minutes and watch a couple of shows, one's called Slot Machines, The Big Gamble, and another one's called uh, The Bet That Blew Up Wall Street. Go to 60 Minutes, Google it, watch those two shows. Nobody's going to debate 60 Minutes. You will see they're confirming exactly what I'm saying here. Oh, some people have, have debated Oh, okay, minutes. fine. Uh, Tom in Hilo. Uh, previ previously of Las Vegas. He points out that the crime rate in Las Vegas Resort Corridor is 10 times the crime rate in the rest of the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, uh, former prosecutor and, uh, and Mayor Carlisle, uh, running mate, the friend, uh, good friend, he, he's come out against it. The police department has come out against it. Uh, do we want more crime? Well, they're, you know, they're... 48 states that have gambling, okay? You, you don't think those, those people are concerned about, about crime? Uh, I think the whole uh, crime thing has been kind of overstated because they always use Las Vegas as the, the typical example. And Las Vegas is hardly typical, I think, of, of, uh, of, of many places that have some form of, form of gambling. An atypical example. You know, the, the federal uh, government's national gambling impact study that the professor likes to quote, uh, also said uh, that the report said, and I quote, taken as a whole, the literature shows that communities with casinos are just as safe as communities that do not have casinos. So well, there. Well, he can say that, and there's a subsequent report published by Harvard and MIT that took about eight years, looked at every community before and after, and indicated that once these gambling facilities come in, the crime rate rises 8% to 10% per year, every year. Why? People lose their money, they resort to crime. You know, and the, the other thing about the slot machines here is this is an island economy. Casinos talk about a 35 mile feeder market. If you have a gambling facility or one casino here, that's 35 miles of everything in, in Waikiki. So there's no place for, for anybody to go. So that would literally dominate the entire no. island. This isn't the first time that I've debated on the same platform with the professor, and I've heard this before, that he quotes the national report, the crime rate in counties with casinos is 8% higher than counties without casinos. 
and I've looked and I can't find that citation. I'd like you to find that for me. I'll be glad to show it to you and just buy a copy of the book. It's document number 1.17, and we also include all the previous studies to show how the entire eight years uh, led up to this published by Harvard and MIT. And for those people in academia, boy, when you get published by Harvard and MIT, you go through a very, very rigorous review process. I know what those Just academic books it. cost. Can I rent it? <laughs> uh, well, I hope your that, library's got that, it. That's an, ex <laughs> that's an expensive book. Uh, here's Denny Kaufman, a uh, state representative from the Big Island. There are 8 million tourists coming to Hawaii with the majority going to Oahu. Why not build a casino in Waikiki? Keep it off. What he's saying, I think, is keep it out of the Big Island, off of the Big Island, and out of the neighbor islands. What do you think he's saying? Maybe he's not. Well, 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 I'm going to interpret it that way. That, that's what then, a moderator has a right to I, do, John. You know, then, 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 there's some creative things you can do with gambling revenue. For example, when I was in office, uh, uh, Governor Zell Miller of Georgia, right. uh, he, he came up with the, uh, this uh, program uh, on a lottery, um, and uh, it, uh, it provided, uh, I think it was pretty exclusive in providing scholarships for the students of Georgia High School who retain uh, at least a, a, a B average, you know, college scholarships for them. They're, they're, they're creative things that, that, that you can do. I would hate to see any general, uh, any uh, uh, gambling revenue going to the general fund. Let, let me, you'd, let, want it, you'd want it tagged for... I, I want it tagged for education or something like that because I tell you, it goes into the general fund, it's going to go to pay raises and stuff like that. Well, if it were tagged, would you be more interested in it if you were still well, in... A couple, of, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I don't think social services will see any of this anyway. I don't think that this, this argument that somehow because we come and ask for all of this money every time and we're the, the you know, we're asking for handouts, which I don't see that as at all. I see it as a conscience. I see it as something that we should be doing anyway and we're not doing enough of funding of programs. And so I don't believe that earmarking is going to be the, 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 the way to go because of all the problems that are going to come. If, in fact, as Denny Kaufman said, all the tourists are coming to Oahu, where is Hawaii Tourism Authority on this? Where is the Tourism Authority? Where are those people who rely upon our golden egg, where are they going to land on this one? Are they willing to risk all that we have already put into place by saying we're going to go down this route? And once we know it starts, the, the, the ability for us to pull things back at that point will be very, very difficult. Yeah, my my colleagues and I uh, worked with Money <laughs> Magazine and looked at every, some years ago on a study, and looked at every state which had brought in gambling so-called to help education. And the conclusion of Money, uh, of Money Magazine state by state was that those states which had lotteries and ga gone with gambling to so-called help education in fact had less real money, real dollars going to education than those states which had gone without the lotteries and without the gambling. And in the case of Georgia, I've got a couple of degrees from, uh, graduate degrees from uh, the University of Georgia, a lot of family in Georgia, very familiar with their lottery program there and their hope scholarships. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution reported that among young people, they have the highest gambling addiction rate among young people in the state of Georgia. So there is a huge negative which is going on in Georgia to fund these so-called hope scholarships. And is the lottery to blame? I mean, do, do they have other forms it, of gambling? I don't understand well, how... Well, when you, when you take the lottery, first of all, the lottery starts out, what, once a week, then it goes twice a week, then every day, now they're into electronic machines. They want to go to Kino. It's faster. And they're going for the slot machines. It's faster and faster gambling. And so, yes, indeed, the lotteries are to blame. They've got young people going in. They're not supposed to be buying lottery tickets, but they're buying these instant games, and they're getting hooked on these things. It's a, some people would call it a rite of passage. Other people would call it a huge social problem. And we, as taxpayers, are going to have to pay for this. Uh, one uh, comment uh, from Rosie and Makakilo. Comment, uh, Hawaii has a high poverty rate. Legalized gambling will just increase poverty. Question, if gambling is beneficial to the economy, why is Nevada's unemployment rate the highest in the nation? Huh? Well, why is, if, if, that, oh, that's very clear. You're just not thinking, you're just not paying attention, John. Listen up here. If gambling is beneficial to the economy, why is Nevada's unemployment rate the highest in the nation? Well, for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, they, they depended entirely, as the governor said, on, on one, one thing, which is kind of not good. And secondly, they overbuilt the place just 
gigantically. You could buy homes out there for $100,000. A lot of our people in Hawaii bought homes there, and then they went upside down in those homes, and, every, and the construction industry went kaput. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, Cindy in Waikiki, people who live in Waikiki have enough problems with noise, drunks, help people that shoot off guns, sirens, ambulances. We don't need gamblers up to the wee hours who lose their money, get mad, get drunk, and make trouble. More, uh, more reasons to, I guess, make noise. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, why wouldn't people from Hawaii not stay here to gamble? Next to Nevada, ha Hawaii is the largest gambling state. Several people called about that. A lot of, lot of second stories going up on houses and a lot of cars parking around them on Saturday nights for card games that I don't think are yeah, constitute we, well, we social have, gambling. We have socialized gambling here. And the only difference between socialized gambling and gambling is, uh, is the provision that the house not take a cut of whatever their you know, monies are. But we also have places where, where people are essentially running illegal gambling houses, right? right? And Cock, they're, cockfights and all of that. And they're being raided and yeah, so, from time so, to so the point, I think, Dan, is that apparently there are a lot of people who want to gamble, yeah. you know? Well, go ahead, well, Alex. I just wanted to say you could use the same argument for people using sub, uh, substance abuse. I mean, we have a lot of people using illicit drugs, and just because it's all over the place, as it is all over the mainland and other places, you should yeah, okay, easily <laughs> enough to say legalize that and oh. tax that, too. I, I, don't I don't think see the that, connection, but okay. well, there's, I'm trying to make a point, and the point just being that I don't necessarily think that because we have a problem with individuals who are doing illegal activities, that by making it legal and taxing it, we're basically going to solve that. I, I don't see the connection there. I, I mean, we've already, we've t we have an opportunity to create our own destiny, and I think that's the, that's the issue oh, that, that we have to face. Yeah, let, let me address that. Uh, I'm jaded. That's a myth that <laughs> one, once you, in fact, legalize it, you're giving the government's imprimatur and permission uh, with regard to that particular activity, and it spreads. And the National Gambling Impact Study Commission indicated that once you legalize gambling in the feeder market, the 35-mile feeder market, actually 50-mile feeder market around a casino, you're going to see a doubling of those people who are hooked on gambling. Watch the 60 Minutes story. These are what we call the ABCs of gambling. New addicted gamblers like crack cocaine addiction, new bankruptcies up 18 to 42 percent as people lose their money, and new crime up 8 to 10 percent per year. Uh, I want to ask a uh, sort of a strategic question, a political question. Does it look, John, as you're down at the legislature, the, the speaker, president of the Senate, both favor gambling. Yes. Uh, there is this sort of fiscal huge problem that you pointed out earlier in the thing. Yes. Is the, and we've been here now. I think every year now for about the last six or seven years having this little meeting, we should bring cards uh, and, and chips. Uh, but, 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 <laughs> but is there a chance this year that in fact we're going to get some? Yes. How good a chance? Pretty good. I, you know, I think that the, the, op the chance is, is there, the opportunity is there. I think people generally want to do it. I think the question that people cannot get their minds around is the degree to which we have problems which need to be solved and the degree to which people really kind of want it. I mean, the people who don't want it are very vociferous. And it's a, it's a relatively small but very hardy band uh, of folks that have been coming out year after year after year and they're, they're, they're loud and they're proud. Who brings you out, John? Uh, actually, it's the Hawaii Coalition Against Legalized Gambling, and there are 40 organizations, is my understanding, uh, including tourism organizations, business organizations, social activist organizations, uh, different denominations. It's very ecumenical. You've got people on the left, people on the right. They all agree gambling is going to hurt the economy. It's going to hurt, hurt the state of Hawaii. Back to your, your yeah. positive. What, there are 30 bills there. What bill do you think has the best chance of getting through? And don't tell me that, please don't tell me it's that open one that doesn't have anything in it, but they're going to pass it through and then you, you get it. Heaven for <laughs> That's uh, the one you're banking on. No, no. House Bill 145 is a good bill. Which is? Uh, that's a one casino in Waikiki. It has a companion bill, uh, Senate Bill 769. Uh, I believe. Uh, Which would? That, that they both do the same thing. Uh, they're, they're both alive. Uh, there are other bills uh, that, that could happen. 
Um, there, are, there, there are a number of bills that um, may very well pass this year. Um, there isn't any doubt that if a bill passes, the governor would sign it. Now, if you, you, you're pretty good, uh, Alex, at getting a, a lot of people together down there at, at the Capitol. We saw you uh, for social, trying to help out social service agencies. Would you fight these bills if they looked like they had a shot at getting there? Or you, would you get out the troops? I think that the troops are out. I think that there is a, a definite um, threat and that I think the money interests behind the threats are relentless. And I do believe that there are some very courageous legislators who are willing to stand up and say no. And I also hope that they are in the majority, I hope. No, 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 are you, uh, uh, let it out, get it out, it'll be yeah. better for you, Ben. Yeah. Come on, say, I don't like the on, sighing man. and all the side We're comments. We're old so. men, we can't, yeah, we yeah. can't hold these well, things. Well, you know, after all my years in politics, I've become a little jaded. I, I used to hear this kind of talk when I was uh, a freshman in the House. Uh, you know, the reality is, is that the many, the, the people who need services are the ones who suffer most. When in my first term, Hawaii's economy was at its worst ever, even worse than today. We had re record bankruptcies, record foreclosures, you know, uh, high unemployment, uh, and we had to cut the budget. And when you take a look at the state budget, you find that the areas where you have the discretion to cut budgets are in the social services. Alex knows this, okay? Because there are only maybe about six or seven percent that you can really cut, the rest are for debt service and all of that. And that's why I can't, I don't understand why these people would come out and, you know, and, and fight something that may actually help the clientele that they serve. Can I, can well, I just respond yeah, real quickly? Okay. Because the, the, the groups that we represented, and again, there were, you know, some 60 or 70 agencies that uh, joined the organization that I formed a few years back, and they were uh, pretty much unanimous in opposition, not just because they didn't believe that should the revenues be generated that it would go to social services in the first place. But secondly, that the social issues that would come as a result, the, the concerns that would happen to the very people that we worry and are concerned about, uh, would, would far outweigh any of the benefits that they that Well, they that's a debatable would. question. Well, yeah, it is. Let me address that if I may. <laughs> first of all, let me, let me indicate in answer to uh, one of your previous questions, that I and several of my colleagues don't accept any honorarium or consultant fees for coming out and educating and informing the public on these types of issues. And these types of reports, generally, everything goes to charity. So, but in congressional hearings, in depositions, in sworn testimony, my colleagues and myself have uh, provided depositions that indicate the social costs are three, four, five, six dollars for every one dollar in benefits. So Alex is absolutely right that you may see some, governing, you may see some money coming in. You will see some money coming in if you can collect it. And, and when you get that money in, the question is, what's happening to the regressive tax on the poor? What's happening to the people who are losing their money? What's happening with these bankruptcies? What's happening with the new suicides? Las Vegas has the largest suicide, or highest suicide rate in the country. Well, don't use Las Vegas as an example, because it's really an aberration when you talk about it. Well, I, I will agree with you there. Okay. I will agree with you there. But, but you know, uh, uh, I want to ask Alex, would you rather have the, the legislature increase the general excise tax? Well, there are other progressive ways to, for us to raise money. Well, okay, come <coughs> on. You got, you know, tell the audience how, to, how you guys are gonna do it. <laughs> well, first of all, again, 12 years removed, I'm not in a position to say what they should or then shouldn't should be doing. you should make that statement. What statement? That there are other progressive ways to, to, to raise money. Well, if, no, no, they, if you, there if you was believe proposals. that, then you should tell the people. Well, there were proposals, as have been put forward, I think by the governor even, that for the higher income brackets, that we could look at income tax increases for them. And there was also earned income tax, uh, tax credit that we could look at for the poor. And these are the kinds of progressive tax uh, policies that we can look at and we can debate and we can discuss. Further, as far as prioritizing for the state, Governor, you, when you were the governor, you, had to, you were in that position as I was. How do we prioritize the needs of the most needy in our state? Where do we put that in the, in the whole budget? The lesson that and I that learned, is, that's the lesson. The lesson that I learned when I was governor is when the revenues are, are not there, the governors have very little choice but to cut the programs that affect the clientele that you serve the most. It's not the, the unions, it's not the, the powerful interests 
who get hurt during those times? It's the poor. John, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I did. We have a budget, a, a state budget of about $12 billion. It's not growing exponentially. It's not getting very much larger. It's not going to get very much larger. But what is growing is, is the cost of government so that more and more and more every day that passes, our budget is less discretionary than ever. So there's no money for this kind of social activities we'd like to, be, to spend it on because we are going to be spending it all on health insurance and on retirement benefits and on wages and on you know the fixed costs of education and the fixed costs of health and so forth and so on. And that is growing. And you know, I wanted to talk about the, the public employment situation. I've been on this kick for about 10 years now. We, when I started, when you started as a professor, when, when the governor started as a young politician in the early 1970s, there were about 10 workers for every retiree. Today, it's one and a half to one. There's one and a half workers for every retiree. In the next 10 years or so, it'll be one to one. That's not sustainable. And we're not going to be able to sustain that in our society. We're going to have to have new sources of income. The average person in Hawaii who is a public employee works till they're about 61 or 62 years of age. 62, 63, right in there. And they live to be 90. That's the average now is 90. So you work for 30 years, you're retired for 30 years, who's going to pay? I, I, I think Ben's going to take care of me. We've always <laughs> been friends, and I, I'm going to drive up there to where, yeah, he'll help me out, I know. Uh, Number one, grow the economy, grow the tourism, go with your strengths, go with what you know. That will bring in some new revenues. Professor, now, it's not perfect. Professor, you don't have a clue as to how, do, how to do those things in this state. Okay. Well, I, I would we, defer we, we got to your people, judgment on this. Okay, on this we got people who are who have been working at it very, very hard. But, but gambling is not going to do it. All the authority indicate that gambling will simply raid your economy, take money out of your economy. And I mean, as I said earlier, I'm chairman of our university's faculty and staff benefits. We have a, have a statewide spread on these types of issues. The gambling interests have literally hurt the fiscal condition of the state of Illinois, and not just Illinois, other states. And so public employees are being hurt by gambling. Hawaii is currently enjoying record sucking, uh, uh, record sucking, come on, Dan. Record setting tourism, can't fathom why we would introduce gambling when people come here to get away from such ugliness on the mainland. They come for the natural beauty of our islands. Why not instead make improvements to our infrastructure and take better care of our environment? Bobby of Maui, I suppose, to, to, to draw more tourists. Is, uh, that, uh, there is a, that's been the sales pitch of, of, of the tourist industry for a long time, that we have a wholesome family place that people can come for beach, yeah. sun, and surf, mm -hmm. and so forth. Would gambling under, wouldn't gambling undercut that? I don't see how. I mean, you know, it would simply be another avenue of something for, for people to have. We're not... So again, we're not talking about a multitude of, of gambling establishments. We're talking about an entertainment facility for people to go to. And it could be, they could have gambling there. They could also have, uh, you know, other, other kinds of events there. We could have, you know, musical kinds of, uh, you know, that sort, of, that sort of thing, musicals and so on. That would be good. We don't have any place right now for our Hawaiian culture to go to actually, you know, perform. One of the arguments, again, I see you shaking your head, but one of the arguments that you hear repeated again and again and again, that you come from a, you come for a seven day stay in, Ho in Hawaii on Oahu, and you go to a luau, and you go to uh, maybe you, one other thing, and after six o'clock or so, there's nothing to do for a tourist. There's nothing to do. You do the beach during the day, and you know, you go to some Watch your site. <laughs> oh yeah, all right. Oh. We have, a big tourist. We, yeah, we have a big tourist uh, uh, audience, you bet. Let, let, me just, let me just indicate, gambling is not family friendly, it's not business friendly, it's not tourism friendly. And uh, Governor mentioned Steve Wynn earlier. Steve Wynn was noted in the 1990s for trying to make Las Vegas family friendly. They tried the experiment there for about three years, it flopped. It's now back to Sin City, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. 
gambling is not family friendly. The other thing I'd point to is Florida, which has the largest tourism uh, base in the country. They're, they're into the tens of billions of dollars. Uh, they have repeatedly in their governor's office, in their Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and the Secretary of Commerce. I remember a quote by former Secretary of Florida Commerce, Charles Dussault, said, gambling is a hostile takeover of Florida's tourism industry. We now, have, if that's uh, Florida, Hawaii, too. John, don't mean to cut you off, but we have sure. less, than a, less than a minute to go. Well, do you think that we'll get a bill through uh, this year, through the legislature, uh, any kind of gambling bill? I stopped predicting things that the, the legislature will do a long time ago. I, John knows better than, than I do. Let me say this, Dan. I don't think people have a real big picture, the, the big picture of what this, this state faces. Uh, I think you're right there. Not only for unfunded liabilities, uh, public uh, 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 employee costs, I'm talking about all the infrastructure, infrastructure things that we need to do and we haven't done. I've got to go. John, uh, will we get one through, yes or no? I think so. This session? No. No. Watch out for the internet sweepstakes machines. They're a sneaky way to get in slots. They may be coming. A lot of interest in the subject, needless to say. A lot of interest. We thank you all very, very much for coming. Good to see you again, John. Thank you very much for coming. Two, two, two Johns and an Alex and a, and a Ben. Join us next week on Insights for a look at climate change. As temperatures and sea levels rise, climate concerns are climbing the political agenda. Aren't we cute? Both here and in Washington. Science tells us that global warming is also causing extreme weather, droughts, and a loss of rainfall that could threaten our freshwater supply. We'll examine this complex issue with some of Hawaii's top climate change experts approaching this challenge from the scientific, environmental, and policy perspectives. That's next time on Insights. I'm Dan Boylan. Ahui ho!